Hello, and welcome to Jolene Knits a Lot. My name's Jolene, and this is my show about knitting and crochet and whatever else I've been getting up to. Hello, how have you been? Um, for those of you who are in uh, the midst of a really deep, deep cold um, and suffering so horribly with power outages in the United States, I my heart goes out to you. I hope that you are staying warm and staying safe. Um, living in Canada, we know cold, but we also know how to uh, live in the cold and our systems are set up for it. But if you're not set up for living in um, a horrible deep freeze, it can be an awful, awful experience. So I hope that you are staying safe and staying warm and getting the help that you need. Uh, and I'm thinking about you. I hope you're doing well. Um, wh what have you been up to? How are things with you? Uh, I have just been, it's been a lot of the same around here. I haven't had a big um, urge to knit as much those last couple of weeks. I mean, I've been knitting, don't get me wrong, but I've been working on a couple of larger pieces and so I just, progress seems slow and I just keep plugging along. So um, I don't know, things have seemed a little bit uh, slow around here, but that's okay. The weather here is slowly starting to warm up our snow is starting to melt a little bit, although today is kind of a cold day. Um, but I'm hoping to get out skating today on a lake near where I live. Um, my kids are on teacher's convention uh, for a couple of days, and so we have some time to maybe get out and get some fresh air and see someplace different, which will be uh, exciting. And so if I do get there, I hope to share some pictures with you um, of the parks in the city where I live. Uh, Edmonton is considered a northern city. We're pretty far north and we do ha definitely have four seasons. Um, but Edmonton is a little bit unique in the sense that we have huge, huge parks that run throughout the city. In fact, our uh, the river that runs through the city, which is called the North Saskatchewan River, um, is flanked on all sides by uh, parks and paths. And the Edmonton River Valley uh, park system is larger than Central Park in New York City. So we are really lucky to have access to a lot of um, walking paths and green space and um, just different sort of uh, parks and um, environments that we can be in within our own city, which is pretty cool and I think pretty unique. Our, the waterfront of our river, uh, it's sort of um, the banks of the river are fairly steep and and they don't allow for uh, I guess sort of built up banks there's no there's nothing really up to the river and so the river is just a beautiful natural area that runs through our, our city which is pretty amazing um, so yeah that's my plan for this weekend anyways to get out skating with my kids uh, do you have what are your what's in your plans what are you doing what are you working on uh, I have no finished objects to share with you this week, so I feel like this episode might be kind of short, but I have some other things that I wanted to show you, uh, maybe to talk to you about. Um, so let's settle in. Uh, grab your knitting or your crochet, grab a cozy beverage of choice, whether that's tea or coffee or a cocktail, <laughs> maybe some sparkling water, whatever you like. Um, so settle in and let's talk. Today I am wearing my daily sweater. This is a sweater by Andrew Mowry. It features quite a boxy, let me see, I'll insert some pictures. Um, it, it features quite a boxy body in the sense that there's a lot of positive ease. Can you see? Uh, I've got quite a bit of room on either side of my body and then the sleeves are quite um, form-fitting and a bit of a drop shoulder sleeve. Um, it's quite a cozy sweater. I knit it in wool folk luft, which is um, a very lofty, soft, soft wool um, in the original colors that the pattern calls for. Uh, it was a lovely knit. It's kind of a bigger gauge, a little slightly um, chunkier yarn. So it was really fun to knit up and um, it's a really cozy knit to wear. Um, this sweater is a little bit more cropped than I usually wear my sweaters. Um, after having a couple kids, I just prefer my sweaters to be a little bit longer. So this one is a bit shorter and maybe I don't wear it as much because of that. But um, recently I've purchased a couple of um, just 
straight kind of dresses that I can layer sweaters on top of and that has allowed me to feel more comfortable wearing sweaters that are a little bit more cropped. Um, so I think part of it is just finding a way that I feel comfortable in of wearing these sweaters because certainly it's a beautiful sweater and I actually, um, it's fine, it's just that you know, we all have days where we feel better about ourselves and days when we feel a little bit more self-conscious. And so a crop sweater for me tends to be something that I only wear if I'm really feeling more confident. Um, unless I have something like a comfy dress on and then it's just like wearing pajamas. So um, I think I might be investing in a couple more dresses like that that I can wear sort of all year round in the spring and summer just as they are and in the fall and winter with leggings and a sweater over top. So that's something I've been thinking about lately. And that's what I'm wearing. Um, but I have some things that I have been making. I'm trying to decide what order to show them in. Why don't we start with some of the older products first, and then I'll get on to something that is definitely not knitting or crochet. <laughs> um, so, oh, the one thing I wanted to share with you is that um, last episode I announced a winner for my 100 subscriber giveaway. Uh, that winner is Linda Bartles. Um, I'll put your name up here. Um, but Linda has not contacted me. I've tried to reach out to her. I'm going to give her a couple more weeks. Um, but if I don't hear from Linda, um, what I'm going to do is take the prize and save it uh, and add it to the prizes that I was going to um, give away in the future. So I think um, if for some reason the 100 subscriber giveaway does not get claimed and in the next couple weeks. I'll just set that prize aside and it will be uh, rolled into a next festive giveaway. So Linda, I hope you contact me soon. I hope that you're doing well and I hope that uh, you can let me know where to send this prize. But if you don't, um, then I think this prize will just get given away at a, at a later date. So what I learned from uh, my 100 subscriber giveaway is that quite a few viewers are crocheters and so I thought I'd share with you my current crochet project that I've kind of been plugging away at um, piece by piece. So um, in the past I have made a granny stripe blanket before. Crochet is actually the first craft that I learned how to do. First really needle craft I guess. Uh, my grandmother taught me how to crochet when I was about 10 and I made a you know a piece of crochet that went like this. <laughs> um, but uh, she taught me the basics and then that, that sort of got me started uh, wanting to create more things. And the Granny Stripe blanket is such a great beginner crochet project. There's really, there's only one stitch after you start. Um, so you chain a bunch of stitches. You do a very simple stitch for the very first row and then after that it's the same thing over and over and over again until you're finished the blanket. Um, and you can edge it. Um, most people, I think, do, but I guess you don't really have to. I edged my first one, and I'll probably edge this one too. I used Sheepy's Metropolis in the Warsaw colorway. <laughs> um, and so this is my current uh, Granny Stripe project. <clears throat> my needle's kind of in a weird spot, but um, the first time I made this project, I used um, leftover yarns, and I just uh, knit or crocheted one row and then changed yarns. This time, uh, I'm trying to be a little bit less uh, controlling <laughs> or anal about my projects. And so I just made up a bunch of magic balls with leftover yarns that I really liked. And I, I'm just crocheting off them as I go. And so this is, um, this is how it's going. This is, I'm planning to make this uh, blanket a square. <clears throat> and I chained about 300 stitches to start um, just to give you an idea of the width of this blanket and so I'm actually over a quarter of the way done um, so I th have um, I placed a little progress keeper this little teacup um, the last time I showed you this blanket so I've crocheted this much which um, is certainly progress but it's not a ton um, this project hasn't been seeing a lot of uh, attention lately, just because I've had other things that I have sort of grabbed my attention more. But now that I've picked it up again, I um, I realize that I'm enjoying it again. So I've maybe fallen back in love with my crochet blanket 
and uh, I'm working on it again. So I've just moved my progress keeper up to here and the next time I have a substantial sort of piece <laughs> that I'd like to show you, I will. But there's some um, some sections that I'm really liking. They're like um, this whole pink sort of um, section with the, there's actually a few different colored yarns in here, but they blend really beautifully. And then these greens, and then I've got some more sort of a greeny with purples here and then a stark change. Um, and then the beauty of the magic ball is that you completely forget what yarn you put in it. And so as you're crocheting along, you get sneak peeks of what's coming up next. Um, I have the first granny stripe blanket. I use mostly Toma yarns, um, maybe some self-striping from leftover socks, but not a lot. This one, I definitely am using some self-striping yarns just to get some different color, I guess, um, pops. Um, the current yarn I'm using has kind of got some neony, greeny, yellow colors with pops of hot pink and blues. And so it's just been really fun to see what comes next and sort of wanting to peek down into the magic ball to see what's coming up. So this is the ball I have on the go. And I have another part of a ball here. This one I added um, a bunch of yarns from some previous projects that I have been working on recently on the channel. So um, it's been fun to make these um, magic ball just in preparation for using them in the blanket, but also as a reminder of projects that I have been recently working on. And um, a couple of the projects today that I have will have some yarns, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'll, I'll probably wind up into these magic balls and they'll see a reappearance in the blanket at some point. So that is my granny stripe blanket. This is a, I don't know if it's so much a pattern as it is a recipe by Attic24. I'll leave a link in the show notes if you're interested. Um, it's a great project for beginner crocheters. Um, and I think that if you were a reg if you crochet regularly, it may be something that you just enjoy picking up. It's kind of, I think it's a little bit like, um, for me, knitting socks because socks are just stockinette stitch. It's something I don't have to think about. Um, and so if you um, are someone who crochets a lot, this might be something you enjoy too, uh, just because it's something that can be sort of meditative and uh, peaceful to work on. Uh, moving on, I have been uh, plugging away at my birds of a feather shawl. Um, I hope I didn't leave it in the middle of a row again. I did. What a terrible knitter. I'm going to just knit away at this while I discuss it with you. Um, the Birds of a Feather Shawl is um, another pattern by Andrea Mowry. She, I seem to knit quite a few of her patterns, don't I? Um, the Birds of a Feather Shawl came out in, I think, the second issue, first or second issue of Lane Magazine. Um, and when it came out, I, I really thought it was quite lovely. Um, so something I thought, oh, that's nice. I'll maybe knit it one day. And I just never really, um, made it to the top of the knitting queue. But um, sort of recently, I had the opportunity to pick up some um, mohair, uh, not mohair, alpaca, Surrey alpaca silk uh, at a recent Yarny event in the fall. And Lord knows there have not been very many Yarny events. So um, the ones that I have attended are quite memorable. <laughs> um, so I picked up some some yarn and it went with a couple other skeins that I have been looking for a use for um, and the project finally came together. This is a very uh, elongated triangular um, shawl. It starts out uh, as a very narrow point and it continues uh, to widen quite gradually um, into a point and then after that point the width of the shawl stays the same, but you continue to work until you sort of um, create the second part of the triangle. That'll make more sense when I get to a point where I can show it to you. Uh, let me tell you about the yarns that I'm using to fill time while I'm finishing this row. Um, the yarns I'm using are some Labiana May. It's a single. This is a yarn that I purchased, oh, quite some time ago. It was part of a fundraiser, um, called the Tits Out Collection that was raising money um, for women's initiatives. And uh, because it was a fundraiser and because it was a cause that I felt strongly about, I purchased a couple of skeins from different dyers, yet yeah, Labianime being one of them. I purchased two skeins of the 
single and when I got it it is quite the two skeins seemed quite different and so um, I was trying to figure out a way to use them harmoniously in a project so that they wouldn't stand out I wouldn't get weird um, differentiations in the knitted um, skeins um, and then I kind of realized that maybe um, birds of a feather would be a good choice for these yarns um, because they're the same colors but sort of different um, depths of color. One of them had a lot more um, deep purples and the other one had a lot more yellow. Um, and the way that this shawl is constructed, there are alternating um, bands of a wool yarn and a mohair yarn. In my case, I'm using a Suryapaka silk. That yarn is from a local to me dyer called Lillian Pine in a color called Ballerina Silvers getting really close to the end. So anyway, because these um, garter bands of the main color are alternating, I thought it wouldn't be quite so um, no no noticeable if I use the two skeins. The lighter skein I am using for the lace sections, there's sort of a feather and fan, which I really love. I do love a feather and fan. Um, and then alternated with garter stitch um, sections which I'm using the darker uh, skein for and so as I get to the end of this row I'll be able to show you um, the shawl itself is as I said quite it starts quite narrow uh, it doesn't get too wide but it is quite long so it's going to be the kind of um, scarf that you can wrap around your neck several times um, and I think that'll be nice uh, as an option this spring because um, spring doesn't just come in gently here. <laughs> spring can take a while and we can still have cold wet weather. And I've gotten to the end of my row. So let me show you where I started. Um, here we go. So as you can see it, it does start quite narrow and this is that darker skein I talked about. Here, um, the yarn alternating with bands of this surreal pack of silk which is incredibly soft and really beautiful drape. Um, so you can see this is that darker skein and then this feather and fan section is the lighter skein. Um, and I kind of like, I like how they uh, play together. It's, it's the same colors, um, but uh, the lighter sort of texture of the lace pattern and the lighter colored yarn um, kind of makes sense to me. And then here's a nice big garter stitch section with some of that more darker yarn. And as you can see, the Shawl is getting wider and wider as we go. Here's some more lace. And I have just gotten to the point where I'm starting a, another lace um, section. And it's actually at this point, it's difficult to tell because it's on the needles, but it's quite wide. But I've, I'm at the point where it is not getting any wider. If you can see here, there's a little triangular bottom. And so now this edge is uh, going to start coming up to um, sort of create a wedge shape. Um, I'm hoping it makes more sense as it goes, but it is definitely a really elongated triangle. Um, and I'm almost at the point where I can think about wearing it. Yay! I just dropped a stitch at the end, which I'm going to fix now because it will lead to problems later if I don't. Um, this pattern is several years old and so there's lots of different pattern or er, projects on Ravelry that you can check out. People have used quite contrasting um, yarns but they've also done this in um, yarns that are the same dye or colorway but um, the dye takes differently to the different um, fibers and so that's also a very pretty effect. Um, mine is obviously more stripey, but I think it'll be really fun for the springtime and uh, it'll feel like a nice pop of color when uh, we start to see some green around here. I am almost at the end of my first uh, skein of the Surya Alpaca Silk. I purchased another one recently. Um, in case I needed another one. So I will be having to dive into that. And a good friend of mine who's working on the same project and using the same Surya Alpaca Silk will probably get some of the leftovers. You're welcome, Terry. Um, because I know that she's gonna need some more too. And that's my Birds of a Feather 
shawl. I have one other um, project on the needles and then something completely different to, to share with you. Um, the Selly sweater, which was um, a pattern in the most recent issue of Lane Magazine, is coming along quite nicely. I have, um, the last time you saw this sweater, I had just divided for the sleeves and had started on one of those sleeves. Um, the last couple of weeks, I managed to finish two sleeves. So here's one of them. The cuff detailing is really interesting. There's this braided stitch pattern that is created in a way that was um, new to me, that's for sure. Uh, I was trying to figure out the written instructions and I did end up going to um, a tutorial that the pattern designer has put up on YouTube, which was very helpful. The pattern designer of this sweater is uh, Alex Bird and her instructions on her tutorial were excellent. Um, so. I'm not going to lie, the sleeves on this were slow going because um, every round you had to do this kind of um, woven um, textured pattern and that um, required you to pay attention to what you were doing all the time and it also required yarn manipulation and I never did really come up with a way of not tangling the yarns very well. So um, I was constantly sort of fiddling with um, my contrast yarns but I think that it turned out quite well there's one sleeve <clears throat> and the um, braided pattern and then a corrugated ribbing which is when you use um, a main color yarn and a contrast color for the pearls of the ribbing um, it's quite um, it doesn't have a lot of give so it's got some nice structure there because of the two color stranded work and so um, I think that those cuffs will be quite useful. I made these sleeves a little bit shorter because I have short arms. Um, so instead of going to I think 18 inches as directed, I went to 17 and then um, finished the patterning. Here's the second sleeve. I can't tell which one I did first and which one I did second and hopefully um, you can't either while I'm wearing it. It'll be very difficult to see both sides of my body at the same time. The other cuff. Um, and then once I was done um, the sleeves, I quickly picked up, like right away, picked up um, stitches for the neckline and did the neckline, which is a very, very similar pattern <clears throat> to the cuffs. Only this time there's only one braided section and I only used one color um, for the corrugated rib as recommended. This pattern has you requires you to pick up a certain number of stitches around the neckline. I ended up picking quite a few more up because um, I was picking up one stitch per stitch on the um, back of the neck, the top of the sleeves, and then the front of the sweater. So along here, along the top of that raglan sweater um, sleeve, and then along the back. And then along these um, sort of angled I was picking up two stitches for every three. That's a sort of a um, ratio that I have found works quite well for picking up stitches along either an angled edge or on a vertical edge because knit stitches and um, knit stitches are slightly wider than knit rows are tall, which is why when you have um, gauge, often the number for uh, stitches in a four, in, let's say four inch or 10 centimeter um, area is fewer than the number of rows you get because stitches just aren't as tall as they are wide. So I picked up the num number of stitches that seemed to make sense to me. Um, and because this is a two stitch repeat, um, I felt like I could get away with it. And I feel like the collar does sit quite nicely. Now I haven't tried this sweater on, but I. I think that um, it will sit nicely, especially after I kind of give it a bit of a steam block to, to set the stitches in place. If it doesn't, I can always rip this um, neckband out and, and do it again. It really didn't take that much time, but I think it looks quite nice and it doesn't pull anywhere, well, which I'm pretty happy with. So now I'm just working down the body. It's just plain old stockinette for days and days and days. This sweater again, so I think we can decide that the color looks good. Okay, anyway, um, 
this sweater again is a slightly cropped sweater, but I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to do it much longer because the um, bottom edge is going to be similar to this, so it won't have a lot of give. Um, and I think that if it sits quite like at your um, natural waist, I think that that could be quite flattering. So I think I'm going to have to give some thought to how long to knit this body before I begin the ribbed edging. But that's my Sally sweater. It's a design by Alex Bird, and it is from the most recent issue of Lane Magazine. Um, and that's really all I've been working on the last couple weeks, except for um, something else, which I'm going to show you right now. This is, oh, I don't know if it's a, I don't know what to call it. Is it a labor of love? Uh, maybe it's a science experiment. <laughs> Um, but I've been working on a circular sock machine. Uh, my incredible husband has uh, been plugging away at printing off some pieces to a 3D printed circular sock machine, which has been quite interesting. As each um, piece has come off the printer, it's given me some time to, to think about how this machine works and how to put it together. Um, so it's been a really interesting experiment in mechanics. For me, um, I am a pharmacist, so I don't put things together besides people's health, which is very different than um, building a sock machine. So let me show you what I have going on. It is not put together because I'm waiting for some parts to arrive. I'm waiting for some screws. This um, project, requires some, some metric sized screws, which you'd think living in Canada we would have access to, but no. Uh, it turns out that M3 screws are not something that you can just go to your local Home Depot and pick up. Or the Canadian Tire. Canadian Tire is kind of like Home Depot, but maybe a little bit, um, it has like more upscale kind of like patio furniture and home furnishings and, uh, it has a great garden center. It's always got toys at Christmas. It's kind of like a Canadian department store that's more leaning towards um, home tools, repairs, and stuff. But as a kid, you went to home. You went to Canadian Tire to get your new bike. You went there to pick up um, skates in the winter. Um, they always had like uh, fun, like pool noodles or inflatables and stuff like that. So Canadian Tire. Um, it's a very Canadian sort of, obviously, uh, store, but they didn't have my metric screws either. So we had to source some online, um, ordered them, they're on their way. Uh, so I can't quite fully put this machine together. Um, I'm also waiting for needles to arrive, which should take a few weeks because they're coming slowly. Um, but let me show you what I have. So the base of this machine looks like this. This was the biggest piece that my husband had to 3D print. As you can see the holes, that's where the screws are going to go through. Um, these pieces were printed separately and this is the uh, crank. So once I get everything put together, that's what I'll be cranking with. Um, the next piece that goes on top of that is uh, this housing. I'm really sorry, this is all black and so it's kind of hard to see. But this piece uh, meshes with the gear here and that will turn around the needles to create this, the knitting. I've got a piece here that holds everything together. On the inside are some little, uh, they're called cams, I think. Okay, I'm gonna get the terminology on this wrong, but this is how I adjust the um, stitch size. By moving them down, I create um, a longer way for the needle to travel, and so it makes a longer stitch. If I move them up, the needles don't have to go down as far. It doesn't use as much yarn, and it creates a smaller stitch. See, I'm learning so much. Um, so this is the sort of um, basis of the machine. As I turn this, this big round piece will move around the needles, which are on something called a cylinder that looks like this. This is an 80 stitch cylinder, um, which will, I think, make a fairly decent sized men's sock knit at a fairly firm gauge. Now, I don't know that for sure, because I still don't have this thing put together, but um, I have an 80 stitch cylinder. 
Um, and my plan is to get my husband to 3D print a couple more. I think I would like a 72 stitch size. That seems to be a pretty commonly recommended size of um, cylinder that uh, seems to be used for anything from women's socks to men's socks. But I know when I knit socks for myself, I knit, uh, hand knit using a 64 stitch uh, circumference. And so what I may do is try and get a 64 stitch cylinder too. Now there isn't a pattern or a file for that that I can find. So I may have to be trying to manipulate an already existing file to make a 64 stitch cylinder for my socks. <laughs> Um, there's nothing that makes you learn more than uh, being motivated uh, to get a finished project. <laughs> anyway, so I have a 80 stitch um, cylinder. So you can see this has got, maybe I put it over here, it's got slots, 80 slots. Each slot will have its own um, needle and those needles look a lot like latch hooks from, if you remember latch hooking <laughs> from the 70s and 80s. It's so the best way that I have of describing it. Uh, and they catch the yarn and pull it down and then move back up again. So as you can see, this is what the uh, machine will look like, hopefully when it's all put together. This exterior piece will rotate around the needles which are um, held in place with those screws. Um, the yarn comes through here. I have another uh, piece that I'm not showing you right now which is sort of a yarn guide. It extends up above the machine and allows the yarn to be fed in from the top. Um, and then this spins around and the yarn comes from the top. Um, again, I have no idea if this uh, machine is gonna work. No idea, but it's been really, really interesting putting it together and learning about how to um, build pieces um, and the functionality of it. These little cam things, mm, a little bit weak, but my husband is already printing replacement parts because he's quite motivated to get this thing to work through. So, um, I don't know if, I was going to say necessity is the mother of invention. This isn't, definitely isn't necessity, but it, maybe it's curiosity. Um, I'm going to need some more of these little, these little bits here are screws and they seem to get stripped quite easily, um, the way that they're printed. And I don't know how strong uh, they're going to hold in there or how strong they need to be. And I won't know that, I think, until my needles come and I actually start attempting to use this thing. But it's been super interesting. Um, and if you have a 3D printer and you are interested in exploring the magic of 3D sock machines, I would recommend that you check out a website called Thingiverse. Thingiverse is kind of like the rivalry of 3D printing. Um, makers who have created their own 3D knit, or 3D um, files or creations, put their files um, on Thingiverse for other people to use. So uh, we just downloaded files that somebody else had um, put up on Thingiverse. Um, and it's been a really interesting place to find uh, other people's creations and um, their creativity. There's a few things that I have uh, seen on there in regards to circular sock machines, not necessarily making your own, although there are, I think now, three 3D sock machines that you can print. Um, there are also some accessories. You can print your own cylinders, of different uh, needle numbers, so that you can make different size socks. But you can also 3D print um, cylinders that will fit into uh, pre-existing or pre-made metal um, circular sock machine. So you can find patterns to 3D print um, cylinders for uh, a Gearheart machine, which is a very popular um, circular sock machine, as well as I think an auto knitter. Um, the other thing that I am going to be asking my husband to um, print for me at some point is um, a buckle, which is sort of a clamp that holds onto the knitting once you've created it and pulls it down, um, an important part of using a circular sock machine. Um, I understand, is um, adding weight to the knitting to pull it down so that the stitches aren't popping out the top. So um, I'm learning a lot um, 
hopefully this machine will work. I will let you know. Um, but I'm sort of, it's been really, really interesting watching the pieces come off the printer and figuring out how they go together and how they are created. And really it didn't take much to be able to put this machine together um, in terms of figuring out where the pieces go. I did a bit of sanding um, of the pieces to make sure that they all um, run smoothly and there's no sticking points. I'll probably add a bit of grease to, or lubrication, something, to the um, edges that the needles run on to make sure that they run smoothly. Um, but I'll keep you updated. Uh, and that's my 3D sock machine. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I hope that in the next couple of weeks I have some progress to show you. I feel like I just have been working away on some projects but not really getting anywhere with them. Um, I do have some ideas for projects coming up that I'd like to share with you, but I'll save that for another time. I will let you know though that recently I uh, stopped into a local yarn store. I was given a gift certificate for Christmas and I had an inspiration for a project that I'm going to be starting after I finish the Sully sweater. Uh, and I wanted to pick up some yarn for it and also I saw that they had some yarn that I was really interested in. Um, so I booked a shopping appointment which you can do at um, the Fiber Nook which is my local yarn store. Um, and it was so nice to go into the store. It was just me and three people working in the store stocking the shelves. Uh, as soon as I walked into the store, um, I was greeted. Uh, I was given so much help in finding yarns that would work for the project that I wanted to. They're so friendly and so kind, and it was so nice to spend some time talking about yarn and knitting with people who love it as much as I do. Um, and I didn't realize how much I missed it until I had a chance to do it again. So I hope that maybe in some small way, my podcast gives you an opportunity to talk about knitting and yarn and crafting um, with someone who loves it as much as you do. I hope in the next couple of weeks you find time to do the things that you like to do. I know I plan on knitting a lot. Bye.